45, they just leave verse 46 out. I'd put it in, one of, one of these. Uh, so, you know, preach on either the psalm reading from Luke or the gospel reading from Luke and include verse 46 in whichever of those passages uh, you want to choose. Uh, Christmas is, um, for me, one of those times when heaven and earth collide. doesn't happen very often, but it happens at strategic points throughout the Bible. Uh, a child is born who embodies not just all that is human, but all that is divine as well. Heaven and earth collide. Now, there's a scientist named Velikovsky years ago who created a stir by... Uh, writing a book called Worlds in Collision, and he theorized that the Great Flood, the crossing of the Red Sea, and a whole bunch of other things were caused by meteors either striking the earth or passing very close to the earth. Nobody paid much attention to him. But in a sense, the Bible is a record of collisions between heaven and earth. And when heaven and earth collide, things happen. Heaven bumps earth, and God walks in a garden in the cool of the day. Heaven and earth bumped together and terrible fire rains down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Heaven bumps earth and Jacob sees a ladder stretching up into the sky. Heaven and earth collide and Moses sees a burning bush that is not burning. Heaven bumps earth and Ezekiel sees the marvelous visions of what will be in a flaming chariot comes down. When heaven and earth collide, things happen. A king is crowned, a battle is won, a warning is given, a baby is born. It just doesn't happen very often, if you... <laughs> not as often as we, we like to think. The Bible has dozens of accounts of earth and heaven coming together, but the Bible spans a record of several thousand years. Jacob had two experiences of heaven. The latter, uh, at Peniel, and the wrestling match with the angel but those two experiences are 20 years apart. Still, we don't have to wait that long between experiences of God's world bumping into our world. Mary, the mother of Jesus, shows us how to bring heaven and earth closer together. Um, I'm kind of an amateur astronomer. This is one of my hobbies. I have too many hobbies. I'm uh, not good at any of them. But, um, yeah. but one way to bring the moon closer is through a telescope. And Mary was that. Mary was the telescope. A magnifier of heaven. Uh, we magnify the Lord whenever we are meek as Mary was meek. Madeline Lingle, you familiar with Madeline Lingle? Wrote a number of wonderful children's books, but also some other serious books. And she, uh, she wrote in The Irrational Season about meekness. She said, I knew meekness when John, friend and doctor, dropped my newborn son between my breasts and said, Madeline, here is your son. And this after nearly 48 hours of work. I knew meekness half an hour later when the placenta wouldn't come. And I began to hemorrhage and spent the next hours fighting for my life. I remember thinking, Hugh will have to marry Gloria in order to take care of the children. And immediately I thought, meekly, no, I'm going to take care of my children. I'm going to be Hugh's wife. I have more books to write. And then all thoughts had to stop. And all concentration had to go into breathing, simply breathing, because I knew that as long as I could breathe, I was still alive. The foot of the bed was raised into shock position, yet I knew exactly what was going on. I tried to concentrate on nothing but keeping one breath following the other as the doctor struggled to get a, a needle for a transfusion into veins which kept collapsing on them. And I kept on breathing, meekly breathing. A fresh doctor was called and one who wasn't exhausted with the struggle of holding by hand the uterus closed in order to staunch the flow of blood. The needle found a vein that would hold it, and life-giving blood began to move in my veins. And I meekly kept on breathing for my babies 
for my husband, for my work, and the breathing was prayer. Please God. Please God. Please God. And the pain was bad, bad, and I kept on breathing and saying, please God. And after several hours, I was all right. And my son was brought to me and put in my arms. And my soul magnified the Lord. It's a beautiful story. Hebrews. It's a Jewish joke, you know. God is okay with us drinking beer because he brews. <laughs> you probably don't want to use that. Probably not. Um. You know, unless some of you really want to preach from this passage, I think we can move on. It, it is a great scripture if you want to preach on our Wesleyan understanding of sanctifying grace. Um, uh, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And um, he goes on towards the end. Uh, See, I have come to do your will. And he abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. So I'll move on unless you want to go back. Yes, there is. Thank you. There you go. Da-da! <laughs> How to be holy without being good. The whole idea that we are sanctified by God's Spirit and not by our lives. So although we are not good, we are not sinless, we still can be made holy. That's called sanctification. <laughs> okay, I want to move on again to Luke 39 to 45. And if you preach on this, please make it 39 to 46. So that Mary will be able to say, my soul magnifies the Lord. <laughs> um, let's see. The main character in this, by the way, is, is not Mary and not the angel. The main character is God, yeah. as always. Uh, in God, we find the one who initiated all the action, who, who possessed all the hope and expectation that this world could indeed be changed permanently for good. And God looked down on a world with a lot of problems and many needs, a world filled with violence and greed. There was no peace. Uh, they have something, um, if lunch is out there, we're going to break right after this one, Rusty. Okay? Uh, peace, they had something called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. But it was peace for the Roman upper class. Not really much for anybody else. And it was enforced ruthlessly throughout the empire. It was a world where people routinely died of diseases that are no threat to us anymore. The average lifespan in those days is said to have been about 35 years. 98% of the population of Israel in those days lived in poverty you and I cannot even imagine. Uh, and here's to me the most remarkable thing of all, that God looked down on such a world as that, or as this, a world tottering on the brink of ruin, a world inherently unsafe and undependable, and God said what this world needs is a baby. And in that decision, God was showing us the most incredible optimism about the whole future of our world. God was saying, there are possibilities here. It isn't hopeless yet. And since the day Jesus was born, every newborn baby's cry is God saying, I still think it can work. Amen. <laughs> I think there's a bright future for humankind. So as, uh, as we go through this season towards the last Sunday in Advent and anticipate the celebration of the anniversary of the birth of Christ, I'm convinced that God looks down on a world not that different from the one Jesus came into, a world that's still filled with uh, terror and 
oppression and greed and violence and crime and war and poverty and disease. And still today, God looks down on our world and says again and again, what this world needs is a baby. And it occurs to me that you and I and the whole church are the angels now. We're the ones who are charged with the task of telling everybody, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We need to tell them because the job isn't finished yet, friends. Amen. The king isn't crowned in every heart yet. We need to tell them because they need to know how much God loves us and how determined God is to guide us to life that is abundant and eternal. We need to tell them because what this world still needs is a baby. That baby. The one in the manger. The one called Jesus. Let's have lunch. Is it ready? It is. All right. Uh, you want to say a blessing for us?